Ladies and gentlemen, good morning everyone to our session Peak China or New China. It's a great pleasure to be here and see you all at uh, the Institute uh, in this raining day. Yeah, there is nothing better to do than talk about China and uh, the outlook for the country. Now, before the break, uh, I hope you all had a great uh, coffee as well. We spoke about uh, the poll and we would like to show the results now. Hold your breath. Uh, can we bring the poll results, please? Right, okay. So, we asked before the break, uh, which statement do you agree with strongly? Wow, all right, that's interesting now. So, we have 62% of you think that China's economic problems are structural and not cyclical, and 34% think that the Chinese economy will get worse in 2024, so quite surprisingly bullish, I would say. China needs deep political reforms to accelerate its economic growth, 32% here, so also not too bad, I would say. But now, before we delve a little bit deeper into this uh, conversation, I would like to first of all give uh, the lady here uh, the first word, uh, give you the floor, and uh, I would like to ask you, could you, in just seven Swiss minutes, to give us a little bit of an opening statement to really pave uh, the way and set the tone for our conversation. Thank you, Martina, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and privilege to be here and also to be amongst uh, my, my, both of my friends. Um, look, you know, the Chinese economy is in serious trouble. We, we, we know that, uh, not least because of the huge uh, debt that looms over the country, youth unemployment uh, rising uh, to 25% and potentially more, and the lowest growth um, in four decades, really, and a very uncertain outlook. Um, but my, my views are that, first of all, I think cyclical, ma cyclical factors do play a role. Look, you know, we had three years of pandemic, a very serious lockdown at the end. There was absolutely no stimulus package for households, the ones that we have seen in Europe and in the United States. Added on top, top of that, there was regulatory crackdowns and a huge um, decline in the real estate sector. Now, if you look at uh, pre-growth trends, uh, pre-pandemic growth trends, pretty much 75% of the sectors have converged almost back to trend, except one big thing, which is the real estate. And I'd argue that uh, different from a lot of the Western common perceptions about peak China based on demographics or state control killing entrepreneurial dynamism, I don't believe necessarily that that's the issue. I think the real estate plus the post-pandemic long recovery is a source of the economic uh, malaise uh, today. Now, uh, if we look at um, you know, China's potential, coming as an economist, first principles, where China is today compared to where it should be according to its potential. We're talking about 900 million people living under $300 per month. That is not middle income by international standards. So that billion people ascendance, much more important than the demographics with aging, you know, 0.5% decline in labor force, et cetera. Uh, is what China should be looking at in the near future. That 176 million migrant workers, which who, with proper urban social protection, can unleash at least a trillion RMB of additional consumption every year, is the kind of scale that we're really talking about. Again, not demographic aging, which, again, is something uh, that is a longer-term issue. So... Um, you know, all the countries that have fallen in the middle income trap, okay, 85% of that, according to data, have been because of productivity loss and because they cannot innovate. I think it's much more significant than two bad quarters of GDP that a developing country can do cutting edge technology. Earlier this year, very significant international organization reports that China leads, at least in terms of research, which is not commercialization yet, leads 35 out of 44 cutting edge technology research. The fact that despite Biden's technology controls and export controls, Huawei has come out with a new phone that has defied US sanctions using chips that have defied US sanctions just goes to show that not only technological restrictions today 
are potentially leaky, but that an entire country is geared towards innovation and productivity, a whole of a nation approach, plus all the big techs, whether you have Huawei, Baidu, um, Alibaba, Tencent, all going after critical technologies, when in the past they were comfortably importing from the US and other countries, goes to show you that there's a huge innovation push. But guess what? Despite the fact that China's EVs, renewables, new energy, new emerging technologies with AI, data, and cloud have all been pretty successful and have a bright future to look forward to, this is not going to displace real estate in terms of its size and contribution to growth and employment, and hence the big problem. You're going to have to tolerate slower growth because real estate really accounted for, broadly speaking, almost up to 30% of GDP. And so that significant structural change away from real estate, which was the steroids, if you will, on which the Chinese economy depended, is no longer going to be the driving force of the economy. Now, going forward, I see that billion people ascendance as the potential to close the gap. And by the way, when Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, all these, Hong Kong, when they leveled off their growth, their productivity levels compared to the US was already at 80, 85%. Today, China's productivity growth as a share of the US, only 15%. Big gap, services, only 47% of employment and 52% of GDP compared to 80% in advanced economies. The point I'm trying to make is that China has a big gap to close, and China, China can potentially close that with proper right economic reforms. Now, the question, according to the survey, do we need political reforms to uh, push through these economic reforms? The answer is a maybe. If economic reforms can continue, re close the geographical disparity, uh, still preserve the power of markets, and by the way, China has the most cutthroat markets, competitive market uh, in the world, I'd argue, coming out with really productive products, then I think that China will just go along, potentially doing a little better, a little worse, but go along. And uh, if not, then maybe political reforms are necessary. I have a minute and 30 seconds to get Ahead back to you. Ahead of time, we <laughs> love it. That's just how Switzerland rolls. It's Chinese time. Chinese Absolutely. We were joking uh, just before that, that the Swiss and the Chinese have uh, some things in common, and one of them is that they're always on time and very well prepared and organized. So thank you so much. That gives us more room and time to discuss afterwards in our conversation. And this makes it very hard. Your great opening, your food for thought for Jörg to uh, follow you now. Well, thank you. It's a bit like the Beauty and the Beast here. It was doing this with curry, uh, so it's a bit of a challenge. Um, but uh, I try to do it in German seven minutes. Um, first of all, uh, the, the feeling that foreign business has in China is certainly there's no peak in China. It's rather a plateau, uh, but with a little slope up uh, that we can see in business. I come to this at the end of my little uh, uh, intervention. Uh, and new China, we would rather label it elder China. Uh, demographics is quite staggering. 13% of Chinese are at my age group, 65. Uh, and in 2050, it will be 30%. So uh, like in Germany, we have an incredible age with all the challenges and headwinds that come along with that one. But uh, the question that European business has, and I, I just referred to EU-China relationship given my past job, and also the fact that I will be on Monday in Brussels briefing President von der Leyen as she's going to Beijing uh, to meet President Xi in December. Um, maybe just uh, about how European business sees China. Um, the question we ask ourselves is, shall we stay or shall we go? Uh, and that's partly not only the economic outlook, that's partly also pressure from home-based NGOs, capital markets. We are overexposed to China. We are not diversified enough, in particular also uh, for my own company, which is a chemical company, as you know. So shall we stay or shall we go? Let me just briefly say on how much we are engaged with China. As a matter of fact, last year, China dispatched 6.4 million containers into the European Union 27 member states, 6.4, we did 1.6. So how can we be dependent on China when we're dispatching 1.6 million containers only? It seems like China's more dependent on our consumer uh, than we are on the Chinese consumers. As a matter of fact, if you look into dollars, at, again, EU27, we sold last year 23% more into China than into Switzerland. Uh, 
So you can see the different size. We are underrepresented in China, and it has all to do with the market access issues that uh, the position paper of the chamber always uh, points out. Uh, I launched a paper in my last one in September uh, 2022, 960 issues. Uh, unfortunately, my successor had to do a paper in September this year with 1,058. So instead of, despite of all these Sunday speeches, we actually have a more complex uh, business environment there. So we could do far more if the market would be more open. The same applies for, uh, for uh, the uh, investment. Uh, every year is about uh, eight, nine billion dollars that you 27 companies invest, but tellingly, it's four European, four German companies, three cars plus my own, that actually stand for one third of the investment into China. So we're heavy there. And for us, there's no question we have to stay there. Uh, China stands for 33% of the global car market, 50% of the chemical market. The, the question of fight or flight is very prevalent. Uh, French companies have decided to leave the marketplace to a large extent. The Germans certainly will put more money into this, as does my company with a $10, $10 billion investment in, in Guangzhou. But challenges will be coming very, very soon. Uh, you know, the new energy vehicles of China are fabulous. Um, absolutely, actually, they're not cars anymore. They're mobile phones on wheels. And uh, China could sell more if they would have ships, but they don't have the ships. We need these roll-on, roll-off ships uh, that have about 5,000 to 6,000 cars. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, only four were ordered over the past 10, 20 years annually. Uh, now China and the shipping agencies servicing China have ordered 170, 170. And they will come on the market 2025, 26. So by 2027, we have 4.1 million additional cars that can be shipped around the world. Mm. This is going to be a massive uh, change in, in trade flows uh, that uh, we have to see how we, how we deal with this one. So in a way, FDI into China, 8 to 9 billion. Well, we do in the U.S. 160 billion every year. Um, comparison is not really fair because in the U.S. 98% is M&As. In China, we virtually cannot do M&As. One exception last year was jacking up the number, BMW takeover of uh, Brilliance in Shenyang, 4.2 billion. As a matter of fact, it indicated also not only how valuable this one-off is in the data set, but also if you take that one deal out, we were at $5 billion of investment in China last year, so minus 40%. And the biggest chunk, again, came from four German companies. So in a way, we invest, on essence, more in Texas than we invest every year in China. And that's also the question I always throw at the uh, discussions in Berlin and in Paris and in, in Brussels. Are we really dependent on China? As a matter of fact, uh, we self-finance ourselves from our retained earnings, uh, so we don't need headquarter monies anymore. But headquarter needs our profit, which in many cases 20, 30, 40 percent. What we also need is innovation from China. China is very bad at research, but excellent world champion in development. And that's the speed, that's the process application, that's the product changes that we are uh, coming up with an incredible speed. And that's where we have to be part of that. So D is a big fat D. The second is that um, we have, of course, incredible good engineers. In my area, 50 of the top 100 universities in engineering and in chemistry are in China. So as we have a significant shortage in Germany on chemical engineers, we actually do stuff in Chengdu. We jacked up our center from seven to 400 people, helping us to establish plans around the world. So in a way, we should not underestimate the fact that China is necessary for us to work with in order to proceed in particular on development as well as in engineering. And the question again, shall we stay or shall we go? Well, obviously, always India comes to mind because it has more population. It's size-wise quite interesting. But if you look at the difference between China and India, uh, last year it was 15 trillion US dollars, 15 trillion US dollars. Now, if China, just to make the point, grows measly one to 2%, and India grows strong, which I think will happen, 6 to 7%, the difference in 2028 will be 17.5 trillion US dollars. Mm. So bigger than it is today. And 17.5 is an interesting number because that's the size of the EU 27 economy. So China in 2028, after having a miserable economic growth pattern, will be one time Europe bigger than India. Thank you. 17, 16, 15. 
Well, you also finished ahead of time, Jörg, but thank you so much for your insights uh, as well. Before we really kick off our panel discussion here on stage, we have two short inputs. Ladies first uh, as well, please, uh, Simona Agrano. She's the Associate Professor at the University of Zurich and Senior Fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute's Center for China Analysis. Please give us short two minutes of inputs, please. An expert to have to ask a question on the state of the economy to the two of them is a very difficult task, but I'll try my best. So the changes in China's economic performance, which for decades actually had seemed immune from the business cycles, but also from the growth constraints that do apply to the rest of the world, have been profound, as we know from the two of you. And we know that China's slowdown is really the result of decades of overinvestment in property and infrastructure, financed by loading debt onto households and local government entities. After years of unsustainable property booms and rising local debt, we know that these entities are finally unable to handle their obligations. And we can probably say that these engines of growth that they once were have now turned into so-called engines of distress. So we also know that faltering growth has already diminished China's once generous international developmental spending. And it seems likely that for the future, Beijing could actually receive more money in repayments than sent abroad. So my question for the two of you would be, do you think that China's current slowdown also could mean reduced export opportunities for the many developing countries around the world? And connected to that, do you think that we will be witnessing a gradual drying out of projects like the Belt and Road Initiative? Thank you. Would you quickly like to reply to her in just... Uh one minute. One minute. Um, yes, fiscal con constraints um, are going to restrict the amount that China can do, can do globally in terms of investment, infrastructure investment. And th yes, there is a kind of a, a retrenchment, if you, uh, if, if you will, of Belt and Road um, initiatives. Although I'd argue that China is going to shift its global exporting more towards technology and renewable energy. We're seeing lots of collaboration developing countries and advanced economies as well. So the global engagement will not stop, but certainly fewer physical investments abroad. Mm -hmm. In the interest of time, or would you yeah. quickly Let like to... Let me just add, uh, China's plagued by one problem, and that has been going on systemically since about 20 years. It's overcapacity. The chamber did a paper in 2009, another one 2016, and overcapacity is staggering. China has 60% of global uh, manufacturing capacity, 60%. 60 uh, luckily, they only produce 31% of the uh, global uh, products, uh, but their consumption is too low, 14%. So you see a mismatch, and that shows in the kind of price war we have. We have a ferocious competition, as uh, Jin Chu has said, uh, Kui has said uh, about uh, uh, pro uh, making on profits uh, uh, nearly insignificant in many ways. Uh, so money is leaving China big time. Uh, but I guess that has uh, to do with two things. One is the differential in interest rates between the US and China is quite big. And then secondly, I think this price war, this kind of uh, ferocious competition we have will lead to a restructuring. We have 140 car companies in China. I guess very soon we will have 40, a best, better would be a single digit. And I guess the, what helps China, or what has to help China is simply export. They have to export in order to actually stay uh, in the game. So China will become more dependent on European consumers and other consumers than it is now. Uh, and that, of course, given the size of the exports they will look up in order to compensate missing comp con consumption at home, will cause trade tensions. Thank you so much, Jörg. Now we have the second uh, input uh, and comments uh, from Alexander, a.k.a. Sasha, by the name of Sasha also, I think you're known. Kapuev, he's the director of the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think that it's a very complimentary two presentations. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the beauty and the beast, but I think that there are two signs of the same object. Like the only contradiction I spotted is that uh, your description was that China is strong in uh, research, whereas I think that you were more skeptical in saying that it's all about development. Uh, I think that 
some countries are tapping into the opportunities provided by these locations in the Chinese economy. If we look at two bad quarters in Chinese trade, the one bright spot in Chinese trade is Russia, where uh, both exports to Russia has grown by roughly 70% to, to date, uh, and uh, imports from Russia are growing as well. But I have questions going into different directions. Uh, and if you, uh, you could provide us uh, a scorecard of the uh, 10 years ago, uh, the third plenum uh, of the Chinese Communist Party dedicated to economic uh, mm -hmm. reforms had put together a very ambitious framework document with the overarching principle, the market should play a decisive role in allocating the resources of the economy. Where are we 10 years after that and that the next third plenum is about to come at some point till the end of the year, like what is the right trajectory? And to York, I think that all of the objective metrics that you described depend also on the choices that the policymakers make. How would you assess the current leadership team that's there, the prime minister, the four vice premiers and other members, since you interacted with a lot of their predecessors, how competent are these people and how sure can we be that if at some point a large property developer, a regional bank, a natural disaster and another wave of US tax sanctions happen simultaneously, this team will be able to fix it and manage this. Thank you so much. Could you take it away? Uh, yes, uh, the plenum that you were referring to laid out a very comprehensive economic reforms and they're nowhere being completed. But I'd argue that in terms of pure market mechanisms, China has improved, although not drastically so. Despite what we're hearing about state control, it's a lot of SOEs and certain strategic sectors, but the vast majority of sectors, manufacturing technology, the market is actually playing a bigger role. And to give you a very important example, local government's role, which was huge in these companies, they have... Um, a, in, especially in terms of innovation, have stepped away. Very, very small, uh, very, very important caps, very small financial participation, lots of limits, and explicitly noting the market has to play the majority role, especially when it comes to innovation. And we've seen a lot of reforms recently uh, in the last year or so making markets more. So I say that market mechanism have preserved, but economic reforms are no near, nowhere near where it should be. Mm, great answer. Jörg? Well, let me... Uh sidetrack a bit, uh, Sasha. I'm glad you didn't ask in Chinese the question. <laughs> uh, uh, trade. You know, we've seen an incredible uh, uh, diversion of trade. Uh, exports from China to the US went down by 14%, uh, but um, ASEAN uh, became the hub. Uh, receives a lot of Chinese companies' investment. A lot of Europeans follow flying geese pattern. The Chinese to invest in Indonesia, in, uh, in Malaysia or Vietnam, and then they export to Europe and the US. Uh, Europe, because of free trade agreement, US certainly to be less on the political radar. So in a way, uh, ASEAN is not a consumption story as I see it, but it's an incredible trading partner for China and Europe in, in particular. Belt and Road, to your question before, we didn't answer. Belt and Road is interesting because it goes through a lot of challenges, but now I sense in Beijing, the biggest challenge comes with, from within in China, meaning like, you know, I am in Lanzhou, Kunming, cash-strapped, and we do what? Uh, 30 billion in Pakistan, and this in Sri Lanka, and so forth. So I guess that the, the <coughs> my Belt and Road Initiative will be far more challenged by fiscal constraints in China uh, mm -hmm. moving forward. Third plenum, uh, uh, the good news is there will be no third plenum this year, so there's no benchmark possible about uh, 10 years ago now, but China did develop and did open up uh, in some quarters, but again, according to us, uh, uh, not good enough. Now, the leadership is competent, no doubt about it. Uh, you have uh, the guy in the machine room, that's Vice Premier He Li Feng, uh, he has outlined the triangle of risk in May, meaning it's real estate, the challenges there that have an impact on the commercial banks. China has 4,000 commercial banks standing for 50% of fiscal, uh, financial assets. 
uh, questionable some, some good. 50% uh, uh, are by very, very strong five big banks, so I don't see a financial crisis coming up anytime soon. But then the weak part is the local government finance vehicles, the local debt burden mm -hmm. uh, that is quite prevalent. Uh, you have 13,000 of those uh, where you can actually look in, in the books. Um, there might be tens of thousands that are sort of semi-city government construction, urban companies, and they lift from one thing alone, and that was land sales. 40% in many cases of their budgetary income come from land sales, but with the real estate crisis, it's not possible. So these poor chaps have inherited an economy which on the one hand was COVID hit by 2022 lockdowns, sentiment, but also displays uh, longer term issues like urbanization is fading away, the good old one time New York every year goes to a smaller extent, still goes on. And then of course uh, the local debt which is uh, pacing. But again, I, I think even in, uh, China in a slow growth mode is, is still uh, big enough for us to be of major interest. Mm, great, thank you so much. Could you let me start with you now in your latest book, uh, the New China Playbook that is on sale, as we heard uh, from Nico. Maybe also some autograph is possible afterwards. You mentioned that the West has a deeply flawed misunderstanding about the Chinese economy, its ambitions and its attitude. What does the West get wrong about China and the Chinese people? Well, first of all, um, people usually think about China as extremely centralized, having a centralized approach. But really, the accurate way to describe the Chinese model is political centralization coupled with an extreme form of economic decentralization. And in this book, in my book, I call this the mayor, uh, we call this in China, the mayor economy as opposed to the market economy. And the mayor economy has um, become so important, whether it's about pushing for GDP, also the real estate, unfortunately, but technology and unicorns and even environmental protection. If we look at the distribution of technology companies, they are all around China, not just in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, but scattered all around. And all these local government officials are competing with each other, are in a real beauty contest, attracting the promising companies, and have built many Silicon Valleys all around China. And that decentralized mechanism is what really actually pushed for these reforms, the growth rate, and will help implement these important economic policies into the future. Mm. Jörg? I, I would say that in many ways, I mean, party and security, China is extremely centralized. When it comes to the economy, it looks more like Brussels, uh, 27 member states. Uh, and that's exactly the problem with the overcapacity. They have a big scheme of Beijing, big plan, big money, all of that. And then every province replicates it. I want my own semiconductor, I want my own car company, I want my own steel, aluminum, and so forth. And uh, the, the, the problem of the beast is that none of them actually goes bankrupt because they are subsidized locally. The problem is Beijing is desperate to cut down from 140 down to 40 or maybe down to 9. Uh, they're very keen to have less oil refineries in Shandong, but they can't really, believe it or not, uh, impose that on the provinces. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the challenges we face. Uh, sometimes we wish China would be more centralized uh, in order to actually solve in particular the overcapacity problem, which is uh, eroding profits left and right and center. Um, but uh, at, at the same time, again, also uh, this kind of competition that you have in the provinces, particularly when you go and see party secretaries, governors, mayors, is very pronounced. You know, I give you A, B, C, D, and then you go to the next city and he's even more competitive. So in a way, we, we play that game to our advantage, I guess. Now, Jörg, you lived in China for four decades most of your life. Some people may argue that you have become more Chinese than German, but uh, you went to China in the 1980s, spent time in the mainland, Taiwan as a student, then became ABB's um, head uh, in uh, 1988. So you have so much experience, so much passion for the country as well. Now you're packing up your bags and leaving. How are you feeling? And also, you mentioned recently that there's no hope that China will rejoin the world. So are the good times? Is the party over as we saw a slide earlier on today? Um, well, the question is, shall I stay or shall I go ask myself? And, and again, I got re get retired next year in July. My kids are uh, school age uh, in an American school in Beijing. So for me to leave China in July uh, next year, move to Washington, but deal with China. So I'm leaving China, but China will certainly not leave me. Um, so in a way, uh, that that is... Uh, 
Uh, so the second part you asked. Yes, you recently said that um, the, the oh, China, yeah, 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 yeah. China will not well, join, that, that was, join the world. That was that was done out of a um, socialization during a period of time when I was lucky to be close up in the 90s, early teens, uh, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Zhou Enji and his teams, uh, people I admire for getting China into WTO, getting China opened up and so forth. That also in the late 80s, the cultural uh, rejuvenation of China was just staggering. So in a way, if we compare cultural eight, late 80s with today as well as the economic opening I experienced, but particularly under Zhou Enji, it is China is turning its back on the world, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, certainly, China needs the world, uh, but uh, in many ways, as a, as a consumer market, uh, but when it comes to cultural exchange, when it comes to universities, when it comes to the, the kind of economic openness, uh, it's not where it could be, put it this way. So I say that a little bit in anger because I see a massive potential of China, um, and I see that China runs the risk of underperforming, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know. So in a way, it's more kind of uh, affection for China, seeing guys, what are you doing, uh, knowing that that they can do so much better, and, and they prove it in some uh, segments like development and in engineering, they're just world class. So in a way, it, this sentence, China is uh, disconnecting, was not meant to be China is turning away and decoupling from the world, but uh, China could engage more. Mm, it's frustrating uh, to see that it's not reaching uh, its uh, full potential. Now, um, let's talk about the macro picture as well. Let's talk some numbers. Uh, Ke Yu, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the IMF, predicts uh, that uh, this year, China's GDP growth uh, will reach 5.4%, and then we have a little slowdown to 4.6% uh, next year. What is your own outlook, and where do the main headwinds uh, come from, either globally or locally? Uh, I, I'm not in the business of putting, you know, 0.1 percentage on top of another GDP, but I think, you know, in the realm of the plausible uh, uh, numbers, that's that's very likely. Um, we're seeing, at least in the third quarter, some a bit more of an optimistic outlook with mm -hmm. a, a bit of uh, recovery, actually led a lot by some of these new energy renewable sectors investment and a bit, little bit by consumption. But I, I just I see this as kind of a long long kind of recovery, right? You know, uh, China opened uh, lo uh, opened up the last and had no package, and now it's on the track to. You you know, kind of recovery, so it will take a lot of time. Real estate is a very long and painful adjustment to a new equilibrium, um, and you know, 5% or even 4.66%, as we mentioned, is already significant for the world. Uh, I don't read, want to read too much in these mm. uh, into these numbers, but just to say, it's a structural shift. Yeah. Change. Do you think, Jörg, that China can once again become the uh, global growth uh, engine? What is your outlook for uh, the economy in the next five years? Well, it will not become the China growth, uh, global growth engine. It is the China growth, growth engine because it's, it used to be 30%. It might be now down to 25, whatever. But there's no second China. That's our problem, you know. And the fact is that they don't engage enough means that like we are undershooting the potential of uh, having growth with China. Um, I, I would say that uh, you know the question initially will 20 will next year be better or worse uh, than this year? It cannot get worse than this year. This is possibly the worst year I've seen. Uh, because of the real estate crisis, the sentiment crisis. So I guess that next year, at least sentiment will be better. They will roll out uh, a program in order to safeguard those apartments which have been started but not finished. Uh, for one company alone, Evergrande, that's 600,000 of them. Uh, they have to fork out the developers. Uh, developers owe these people that have downpaid uh, to finish the apartments uh, in a staggering amount of one trillion US dollars. I'm sure that Beijing will look after that segment first and foremost, so there will be construction activities which then translates downstream into stuff that you need for, for the houses. Mm -hmm. So it certainly will also be better. Uh, and this year's numbers are sort of irrelevant because the base is so different last year. You know, it's, uh, and, and again, uh, it's great on services. So for manufacturing, if you see that it's 5%, but based on domestic tourism and catering and whatnot, then it doesn't help you really. Um, so in a way, we look at the real estate crisis, how they deflate that problem, but it certainly will never go back boom, boom town uh, mm. parts. Uh, so I guess eventually China stable at 3% would already be best case in my, my assumption. Mm. 
Now, one uh, light at the end of the tunnel is, of course, the technology and innovation uh, sector as well. Also, EVs and AI. We have uh, um, a lot of uh, autonomous vehicle businesses uh, as well. But do you think that they will be able to survive the regulatory crackdown, also more government control? Because just today we had Douyus, a CEO, a social media video platform being arrested. What is your view on the technology sector going forward? Uh, innovation and technology and high tech is the absolute focal point of the top leaders. They will do everything to preserve it, to push it, to do what it can. What it can. And again, as I mentioned, the the government deliberately saying the state needs to back off, you know, in, in more of the the participation in that sector. So it's something to protect um, because that is the existential crisis for China. Uh, I don't really agree with the general sentiment that entrepreneurship or the 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 thirst of entrepreneurship will die down because of the regulatory crackdowns. Yes, it's swept through uh, education to technology to healthcare to financial system. But I also don't look back at the 2000s with an absolute rosy picture because the amount of, uh, you know, corruption and just the sheer um, unregulated bad behavior also really took, you know, took place all over China. Do you think there will be, again, like unicorns such as Alibaba, Tencent, ByteDance, or do you think there will be more SMEs? that are growing? I, I think that to have these crazy explosive growth, mm. that era is over. Um, but if you, again, you look at the data and the rising number of uh, very competitive companies in all these sectors are rising, probably just not at that scale. Um, but the government has come out to also, actually also come back to resupport these platform economies because, again, they are an important driving force of the economy and employment and so forth. So I think I, I, think I would make this point is that to the, the importance of having an open, free society with a little government control is really critical for breakthrough technologies, mm -hmm. zero to one technologies, putting people on Mars and curing cancer. But in terms of high tech, cutting edge technology, reverse engineering, that's, that's a mastery of skill and accumulation of knowledge. I don't think that does that too much damage on the Chinese markets. Jurga, you have agreed that uh, China's blockbuster growth uh, period is over and that one problem is that Xi Jinping sets basically the uh, party ideology and uh, nationalism before growth uh, as well. I've known you for like 10 years now, out of your 40 uh, in China. You've always been very optimistic about China, but I sense a little bit of recent pessimism. Why so? Well, I always was trying to be realistic about China, mm -hmm. uh, not getting rosy-eyed about uh, what's happening. And if you trace back uh, what I said over the last 20 years, uh, many things didn't sound very rosy, what I said about China. But the most important to me is uh, that uh, uh, who's going to have the upper hand, the security apparatus or the economic decision makers? It sometimes feels like China makes two steps for forward and one backward. Uh, again, uh, desperation in the provinces to attract more foreign investment. I've been touring all my nine cities when I stepped down from the chamber uh, in, in the first half of this year, clearly incredibly engaging, trying to lure uh, foreign investment in there. And then you have the anti-espionage law, then you have the data transfer for issues and you go like what you know uh, I feel very bad for these mm -hmm. local leaders that are fantastic um, and I think there's a new generation building up in China uh, which is not the kind of cultural evolution type that you find right now sitting in Beijing you have a fantastic party sector in Chongqing a very good mayor in Shanghai so maybe after 2027 we get a different noise level but the sentiment is not good right now I can sense it that uh, in my where I live in this villa compound uh, close to the airport uh, one third of the houses are dark at night and that's all very rich Chinese venture capitalist and so forth and I guess they're all in Singapore right now <laughs> enriching your economy or the Emirates, which is luring them in. Unfortunately, nobody wants to go to Germany. That's a big problem. Um, so, um, He's laughing. Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I think China again and again has the potential from the brain power, from the from the way the uh, uh, working ethos, the kind of DNA that Chinese has displayed. But it's very telling that over the last uh, 50 years, uh, not a single aut authoritarian system has passed the middle income trap. It was always democracies who passed that threshold. And so in a way, I don't really see that China becomes democratic in our sense, but it's really important in order to have est institution established in order to actually counter the kind of wild East that we have seen over the last 20 years 
uh, there were excesses, definitely. And, and I'm not sure if China finds the political will to develop these mm. uh, institutions. I want to talk about uh, the next generation as well, because we have a fantastic interaction with the Gen A here today. Could you let's talk about China's Gen Z and the millennials. In the past, they used to save money for the uh, rainy days and for their apartments and cars and so on. But now it seems they want to really enjoy life and have a consumption uh, lifestyle. What about the next generation? Um, will they be a positive force for the economy? And will they be able to manage to bridge with the West and find more open doors here? Uh, the new generation is very, very different. Uh, the gener generational gap is enormous in China because of the changes that China has gone through. This generation loves to consume, even likes to borrow, so we're inviting new problems to the Chinese yeah. economy rather than saving. Um, they, they love leisure. Uh, data have shown that despite earning much less income than their predecessor in different generations, they spend twice as much on clothing and entertainment and food and travel and all that. So, and also they're a more relaxed group, which could be better for the world mm -hmm. because you know they rather lie flat than take up the the Foxconn three sh three nights three shifts a night kind of thing. So I think and social values are very different. They care about inequality. They care about animal rights, about environmental protection. All the data has shown that they care about diversity. Yeah. So I think in that sense they are much closer to the Gen Zs around mm -hmm. the world than the other generations. And a lot of women I notice every time I go back to China don't want to have children anymore. So this whole Sheng Nu, this leftover uh, women problem is not actually there anymore because women can more do what they want, at least in uh, the big cities like Shanghai and Beijing. Gender, and, uh, gender equality is the best I've seen in the world in yeah. China. And that's also thanks to the one child policy, because all daughters are educated as sons. Yes. Um, Jorge, now you met a lot of these uh, policymakers, Li Keqiang, the late uh, premier as well, several times. She was re-elected for a third time in 2018. I left China in 2017, and in my personal opinion, the country went uh, downhill uh, from there. Now, um, wh what is the... <laughs> Not because of me. Oh, what is going to happen when you leave your the country will cry um, uh, like the Yangtze River as long as that. Um, what future direction, maybe from a little bit of a political view, will uh, the country take? Oh, really, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can't barely say what's next year, mm. let alone what's in the next decades. But I think uh, adding on to Curry's what she said, the young kids have a real problem because, I mean, their surroundings is aging. Uh, the load on future uh, pension is on them. Mm -hmm. uh, the old kind of, you know, I have an apartment I'm looked after and so forth. Again, if you have 66% uh, of your family's wealth in real estate, you know, Beijing, you've got a problem, you know. So these young kids actually uh, have a really tough uh, mm -hmm. future to look after people, look after a different economy. And uh, it shows in data set, uh, the insecurity is quite high. We have half the marriages that we had 10 years ago. Uh, we had 70 million babies born 10 years ago, now it's eight. Um, so uh, people are voting with a lifestyle and, and that's a challenge. So I, yeah, it's, it's going to be a tougher future for those guys than it was for those that grew up in the 90s. Mm -hmm. sure. We have one quick question to each of you and please uh, be as short as possible because we're already reaching the end. Could you, first of all, um, the decoupling or the risking, whatever you want to call it, between the US and uh, China has, of course, huge implications for the world, also China's alliances with countries like um, Iran and, and Russia. What will this mean for China's long-term implications and the global economy? I just want to say that some of these views are said, you know, prioritizing other things over the economy in times of confidence. Yeah. Now we're not in times of confidence, we're in times of crisis. So they, they could well shift their economic strategies and reprioritize the economy. But to your question, look, you know, all around the world, we're seeing each nation for their own. I'm sorry to say this, but this is happening everywhere, and that's going to be a reality of power politics. Mm. Jurga, you have uh, released a lot of uh, foreign business. Uh, where do we have it? Um, no. It has disappeared. There was a slide on uh, the uh, business confidence, but um, let's the blue one. All right, this one here. Okay, fantastic. So um, with the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, 
together with Roland Berg, you released so many of those uh, surveys. The recent one said that only 55% of foreign businesses active in China are optimistic about the outlook because we have so many people here from uh, foreign businesses and people who are active in China. Can you just reiterate uh, whether foreign companies should stay or leave like you do? I'm sure it's only 55% because I stepped down from the chamber. <laughs> it had an immediate impact. But look at this. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's single digit and pessimistic. I mean, we should look at that. The glass is not even half half empty. It is quite full. Um, and again, uh, the, the view I have is uh, uh, it's fight or flight. If you stay competitive, if you want to be a global player, you have to be in China. There's no question about it. Thank you so much. That was uh, your good and Koyutin. Thank you so much for your insight, and uh, I give it back to Nico.